You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 74, Why Bitspark.io Stopped Using Bitcoin for Global Remittance and Now Uses BitShares, with guest George Harrop. Welcome back, everyone, to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and today we're going to talk about moving money around the world. Uh, my guest today is George Harp. He is the founder and CEO of Bitspark.io, a remittance platform for money transfer businesses and was the world's first cash-in, cash-out blockchain remittance service. George, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, Ash. It's uh, great to be here. So fill in the gaps for us, George. Who are you and what is BitSpark? Yeah, so um, uh, for those who are not familiar, my name is George Harrop. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called BitSpark. I'm talking to you today from Hong Kong. We're based here in Hong Kong. We've been here for about three years. And essentially what we provide is we provide the software, the platform for physical money transfer shops. So these are the physical shops which you would go to like a Western Union, let's say, you know, one of these agents where you walk into a location, you hand over some cash and you say, I want to send to a destination somewhere in the world. So uh, those services, those companies, they need to use some sort of software in order to convey their money. And that's where we come in. So we're, we're sort of the back end for these physical shops, which are really the backbone of the entire remittance industry. Right. So you guys aren't looking for individual clients looking to send to their friend in the Philippines, for instance, you're concentrating on the B2B aspect of like, um, um, like, I guess, give us an example of who one of your clients could be or who's your ideal client. Yeah. So we are looking, we have different types of accounts. So individuals can make an account on BitSpark. That's entirely possible. Uh, but our core customer is really the, the business, uh, the, the small business. So I'll give you an example. Usually, if you're a, a small money transfer business, let's say you, you've just set up somewhere in the world and it's a global thing, it's everywhere in the world. Everyone sends money wherever they may be. Um, you're a small business, maybe a couple of people, uh, and you want to convey money to a whole bunch of different locations. Now, let's say you're here in Hong Kong. If you want to get access to, let's say, cash out facilities in the Philippines or Indonesia, how are you going to do that? You know, who are you going to call? Uh, in order to do that. Are, are you going to call up 7-Eleven and sign a deal with them and pay a lot of money to try and get access to, to their cash out at the other end? No, because you're just a small, you know, small fire. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're usually going to look for a platform provider and, and join one of these larger networks and become an agent for them, essentially. So what they do is these smaller sort of individual entrepreneur businesses, they become part of these larger agent networks. Uh, usually they connect to many different networks to sort of send to different countries, different types of customers. Um, and, uh, and essentially that's how they can run their business because they don't have the capability to actually go and, and cut the deals themselves. So their customers are you know, people who don't have bank accounts and want to send money. The, the size of the remittance industry is $600 billion. About 80 to 85% of that happens through physical money transfer shops. Um, so, you know, that goes to show that usually, uh, you know, in, in places like Hong Kong, US, EU, we all have bank accounts, right? But for most of the rest of the world, uh, people don't. And this is actually how money is conveyed around the world. So, you know, these shops are the real key location for these, these individuals. Yeah, I remember when I was living in Panama, um, I would go to the mall and just see every single day there was a line of a 50 to 100 people outside of the Western Union. And I, it just surprised me so much. Like, how could something have that much uh, demand? But it's because they don't have bank accounts. Or if they have bank accounts, they weren't allowed to send internationally. So maybe you had family in Venezuela or Colombia or Argentina where the currencies aren't as strong and don't preserve your purchasing power. In, the, in Panama, they use the United States dollar, which up to this point has been a better preservation of wealth than some of these other currencies. So they basically would send their value, send their wealth of their dollars to their family in these other countries, and they would do it through Western Union. But Western Union would charge how much, George? Well, I mean, it can be upwards from about 5% to 20%, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. Yeah. And so yeah, you guys crazy. were the first cash-in, cash-out blockchain remittance service. 
what does that even mean? Yeah, so I, I guess to take, take a step back, you know, how do things currently work in the world? Um, if, if you're a money transfer shop and let's say you're partnered with someone like a Western Union, you're an agent for them, right? You, you give some cash to Western Union and then they handle all of the trading and the functionality. Um, so that means that Western Union has a lot of people who are trading FX behind the scenes. They have bank accounts all over the place. Uh, they're moving the money themselves and they're charging you uh, quite a hefty fee for the privilege of doing that. So the real sort of benefit with using the blockchain uh, to do it is we remove the need for all of those overheads, all of those sort of cumbersome uh, overheads of, of running, you know, a 20 person FX desk in, in different countries and, and locations around the world is we just automate everything. So we're using Bitcoin as the means of transmission uh, up until now uh, in order to send money rather than various banks, FX providers, different brokers and so on. So it just means that we need to exchange Bitcoin for one currency and then sell Bitcoin for another currency. And essentially that's what we did back in 2014 is we partnered with another uh, Philippines based company uh, here in Hong Kong to enable people to actually send cash in cash out from Hong Kong to the Philippines. So they, they give us cash, we convert it to Bitcoin um, and we sell that Bitcoin essentially for pesos at the other end. And that's how we started. And that was, you know, we got started just doing it for essentially individuals. But then we actually saw that the bigger, uh, the bigger opportunity was instead of trying to compete with these shops, how about we try and be their friends? And, uh, and that's why we sort of decided that, you know what, uh, and in about 2015, late 2015, uh, we decided to build the platform for the physical money transfer shops rather than the individuals. So that's where we came to, to do, you know, what we do today. Right. So the reason that you started using Bitcoin back in 2014, I imagine, was because it's so expensive, slow, and maybe not even available to send money internationally. And so what you were doing is you were taking the cash in, purchasing Bitcoin, however, through a liquidity provider of some sort, and then transferring that Bitcoin over to someone else who could cash out in the currency that you needed, like Filipino pesos. And you weren't actually holding the Bitcoin as a currency. You were just using it as a means of transmission. Um, what has changed since then and how has your business evolved? Because I believe that you're using bit, the bit shares these days. Yeah. You know, we've, we've been using Bitcoin for a long time. Um, and it, it's fine. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons why Bitcoin is great. It's, it's cheaper uh, mechanism in order to exchange money in, in various exotic currencies. And that's the key thing as well, is that if you're doing US to Euro payments, you might as well just use an FX broker. But if you're doing, you know, some country, uh, some currency, let's say Vietnam Dong or Indonesian Rupiah, well, that's where the benefits of crypto really come into, uh, into play because it's, it's super easy to be able to access difficult currencies. So, you know, we've been doing that for a while with Bitcoin, but the problem has always been that, you know, let's say I, I want to send money to uh, Thailand or Cambodia or something like that. Um, if I go in and you know, convert the Hong Kong dollars here in Hong Kong to Bitcoin and then send you the Bitcoin, I need a counterparty at the other end willing to exchange that for an equivalent fiat value. So, you know, I need to integrate with, you know, different partners that would be able to do that, liquidity providers, um, and I cannot enter a country or jurisdiction where that's, you know, that, that if, if that's possible, great, I can do it. If, if it's not, then I can't. And I get people coming to me all the time saying, well, George, I'm from Sri Lanka and I have a money transfer shop. Uh, can, I'd really like to use Bitspark. Can I use your system? And I say, well, unfortunately, uh, there's no Bitcoin liquidity in Sri Lanka, so I, I, I can't take your business. And uh, that was really annoying me for a long, a long time. So... Uh, we've now switched to BitShares and there's a whole sort of uh, discussion which I can get to in about why BitShares is, um, is, is the best mechanism for sending money in my opinion. It's all about creating a pegged cryptocurrency and it being able to exchange that around the world. Yeah, so for my listeners, um, BitShares has been around since I think 2013 and it's a decentralized exchange where you can issue your own smart coins and back it with X percentage of bit shares, the currency, and through some really neat and intelligent economic models, they've been able to, for several years now, establish um, cryptocurrencies or uh, smart tokens on the bit shares platform 
that represent the value of say the US dollar or the euro or really anything that you want to put up there as long as you have the collateral on the back end. Um, and it trades freely on the BitShares decks or decentralized exchange. George, when did you learn about BitShares and when did you figure out that, wow, this could really give me access to some of these currencies or maybe not the currency themselves, but the price of the currencies to ease your business. And, and when did you learn about that? And how are you currently using it? Be, be specific, because I think that BitShares is very undervalued at the moment. I don't think people really understand what BitShares can offer. And for some reason, it doesn't get any of the attention or any of the hype that I think that it, it should and that it will in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, some of the reasons uh, why we use BitShares. Firstly, it's about, uh, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, BitShares is uh, the ability to create pegged cryptocurrencies for remittance companies is super important because as I said, being able to access different liquidity providers around the world and different currencies is super hard. Like if I want to go and access uh, a currency, let's say in Central Africa, I want the Central African franc. I want the ability to, for me to be able to send Central African franc to, to, to someone. How am I going to do that? Who am I going to call? Uh, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to talk to some broker. And that's probably the only broker who does that currency. And, uh, you know, they probably do for Western Union as well. So I'm going to be able to get exactly the same rates as Western Union. So it's not really a huge value add there if, if we all have to go through the same gatekeeper. And there's about 180 currencies in the world. And there's only really about 20, of, 20 or 30 that are, that are freely you know, available in, let's say, a multi-currency bank account. So what about all of the others? You know, generally, all of the others have these different gatekeepers and brokers, and you can only do anything with them if you're in the physical actual country and you have a bank account. Um, and that's not a very scalable way to, to grow the business. So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're now in the process of switching to BitShares uh, in, in BitSpark is, and in our back end. And we're switching from Bitcoin to BitShares A for us to be able to create a pegged cryptocurrency for any currency in the world. This means that instead of me having to go and look for different liquidity providers in different currencies, they can actually be created uh, on the DEX without needing local fiat backing in the local country. So if I wanted to make a Thai baht, I could sit here in my office and as long as I backed it with enough collateral, I could make a, a bit THB uh, right now. And that means that I can then trade into bit THB. I can preserve the value pegged to, you know, one to one, one Thai baht is one bit THB. And then I can trade out of that as necessary. So I don't need to be in Thailand. I don't need to have a counterparty in order to do that. So that's two really big things is that now I can actually move into any currency, any country, anywhere in the world and be able to trade into and out of that currency importantly, without a counterparty, because everything trades on the BitShares DEX. So usually when you're running a money transfer business, I have to go and send some money to, to some country, to some broker, to, to sit there on account, which then will get paid out at, at some time interval. But if I don't have to do that, if, if all of the trading is within my control, if all of the money is within my control, and I'm just trading with other people who are interacting with the, with the BitShares exchange, then that's a much better value proposition because I don't have to trust my funds to anyone. They're all within my control. So that's super, that's super you know, important as well. And, and of course, BitShares, uh, in, in terms of transaction throughput, it's 3,300 transactions a second. That's what it's actually been tested at. Ethereum's at 15. Uh, Bitcoin is at about seven. Um, and uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, they don't really have any decentralized exchange that's been operating as long as BitShares that has pegged cryptocurrencies that has all of the features that BitShares does. Um, so, you know, that's why we made the decision to really just go ahead and go, you know what, if, if, if I want to be able to say yes to businesses wherever they are in the world to use our service and be able to offer them a service in their local currency without BitSpark having to have a local bank account, go through a gatekeeper, all of these different things, then really the only option for me to do that is with a pegged cryptocurrency and the only blockchain which has been able to provide that um, and have the, the backing for three years, it's been pegged you know, uh, spot on with the US dollar, with Chinese yuan, with uh, euro for a long time now. It's got, a, it's got a good track record. 
then BitShares is the only real option. So, you know, that's, that's some of the reasons why uh, we're, we're switching to BitShares. And I know that a lot of people are probably thinking, how do you just invent these currencies on this BitShares DAX? How, how do you keep the price? Um, I'll try to link to uh, a paper that um, Dan Larimer wrote back in 2013 about smart tokens, excuse me, smart coins. Uh, I can't remember, are they smart tokens or smart coins? Smart coins. Smart yeah. coins, right. Uh, I'm always hesitant to call these things coins <laughs> these days, and they're tokens yeah. or whatever. But, <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll link to that article in the show notes so people can go. Dan breaks it out really well. He's he's a brilliant guy, uh, one of the most underrated guys in the in the space, in my opinion. And his economic understanding is really on point. But so, if you can and if you have time, walk us through like whenever you let's say you wanted um, price exposure to the Thai bot, you would go on the BitShares Dex and you would create a new smart coin. And just like give us a couple of the steps. I mean, if, if you don't mind, if, if that's something you can do in this type of interview. Sure. So in order to create one bit, uh, bit THB, let's call it uh, a bit Thai bar. That's what we call it on the bit shares ecosystem where you make a pegged cryptocurrency. So in order to do that, I need to back it with collateral. So I need to use the BitShares core token. Now the BitShares core token is much like any cryptocurrency. It's currently trading at, I think about you know, five, six cents, something like that. So it has a value. So if I back one, if I create one bit Thai baht, then I need to back it with at least at least two times the value of that in bit shares. So I need at least you know two uh, x the value for every one Thai baht which I create. So as a trader, I can I, I can do that. But of course, what price am I actually going to do that? And this is this is where you know how to how to peg currencies get their pricing information. Well, anyone can actually provide a price to a, to a currency. So there's a decentralized network of people out there which are willing to provide prices for what is a Thai baht worth and what is that in reference to a bit share. Um, and a lot of these people can provide these pricing feeds and they get paid to do that. So essentially the more people that provide a pricing feed, the better. Because the blockchain doesn't know how much a Thai baht is worth. It has no idea. It's just this dumb thing that, uh, you know, uh, facilitates, right. So you need to exactly facilitate. So you need to be able to provide that information somehow. So this is the economic mechanism uh, for people to actually do that. And what the blockchain does is it takes a median uh, value of, of the price of all of the different people that are providing uh, that information. We pull out the settlement price. So if I'm backing it with uh, collateral to create my, my Thai bar, I can do that at the settlement price. So, okay, uh, I've, I've just, uh, I've got a Thai baht, which I've now backed with some bit shares, and I've backed it at the price called the settlement price. That's great. Now I have this thing called a Thai baht. I, I can then go and, and sell it on the bit shares DEX to someone else who might want it. So what usually happens with these, uh, with, with these, uh, with these peg cryptocurrencies is there's a floating market price. So let's say Thai baht is really in demand. There's a lot of money transfer shops. Uh, connected to BitSpark, which really want to get access to the Thai bar. Uh, so there's, there's going to be more buys placed on the network. Then that means that as a trader, uh, the, the price of which they're willing to pay might be higher than what the settlement price is. So if I go and make uh, a, 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 bit, a bit Thai bar, let's say at 10 bit shares per bar, um, if I go and make that right now, but people are willing to buy it for, let's say, 11 bit shares, well, hey, I just made a, a sweet 10% profit. So as a trader, I'm incentivized to go and create this bar and create that liquidity in the ecosystem because I'm going to make a profit. So there's a free market incentive there for people to actually go and provide liquidity uh, in the market to, to be able to do that. So that's a super important mechanism. So it's, it's kind of like as long as there's a demand for anything, the liquidity will follow. And what we're trying to do is we have the shops who have the demand. They have the physical cash sitting there. They're ready to go. So you know, traders can be incentivized to go and create liquidity for this because of course they're going to profit. And why, why wouldn't you want to do that? So, and they can do that from anywhere in the world. Usually with a Bitcoin exchange, they need to have physical access to Thai baht in the local fiat, deposit it in an exchange, um, whereas they don't need to do any of that. They just need a bit share, which you can get you know, anywhere in the world. 
Right. At, at the cost or at the expense or at the risk of creating too many Thai bots, introducing too much supply into the marketplace mm -hmm. and then seeing it drop in price because the supply outweighs the demand for Thai bot. This is just the, the back and forth. This is the price discovery that we would expect for any any good or service right or any currency for it, that matter and so yeah they can jump in if they if a trader sees a large demand for tie bots jump in create more tie bots bit tie bot on the net on the decks start selling them but if you get too zealous then you know you're going to create these tie bots and the demand's going to drop and maybe you've lost that 10 percent so this is the pricing mechanism that the decks can use to to keep it as close as possible to the actual price of the price feed uh, that we're getting in from these these outside sources. Um, how does this? Yeah. So how does using BitShares now? I know BitShares has less liquidity, a lot less liquidity than Bitcoin, and it doesn't have near as many on and off ramps. How does the switch to BitShares change uh, the cash in cash out model, if at all? Yeah. So for us, we're doing the gradual switch. So over a period of the next twelve months, we're certainly putting as much liquidity as we can from Bitcoin onto BitShares. And we're going to be focusing on the main BitShares currencies. So, you know, BitUSD is the big one, BitCMY, BitEuro, and there's a couple of other ones as well. But of course, there's a lot of currencies in the world that are actually pegged to the USD or pegged to the Euro. Um, so we can actually borrow the liquidity, the underlying liquidity of say BitUSD and be able to offer them as well to our customers. So for example, I'm sitting here in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the USD at 7.78 right now. So I'm able to use the underlying liquidity of BitUSD to be able to offer customers, uh, you know, Hong Kong dollar uh, transactions via the BitShares network as well. So, you know, liquidity is something which BitShares, I think, is still um, yeah, developing. But uh, I think certainly, especially for small value payments, there's, there's enough there in order for us to, to be able to make some real value in doing what we're doing. And, and, uh, and that's only going to improve over time. And essentially, you know, what we're doing is our first pilot of this project is going to be with the UN in Tajikistan. So we, we have a, a pilot project with uh, the UNDP over there to essentially roll out a money transfer service. And it, for rural areas, financial inclusion, a lot of these kind of things where people you know, don't have access to banks. And just a bit of background for those who may not be familiar, Tajikistan, country in Central Asia, about 30 to 40% of the GDP is dependent on remittances oh, wow. and like half the population of the country works outside of the country, usually in Russia. Um, so there's a lot of money coming back and that's pretty much the lifeblood of the whole country is remittances. So it's super important, um, you know, much more important there than it is probably anywhere else in the world. Um, so what we're trying to prove is we're going to be using, uh, you know, BitShares and, and the BitSpark system for the physical money transfer shops there in order to be able to actually send and receive payments. And you know, it's, it's going to be super exciting because also usually you know, we as let's say a, a money transfer provider, we might need a bank account in, in Tajikistan if we were to do it the traditional way, right? You know, we would have to have access to the local currency called Samoni, not exactly a globally traded currency. So you know, how are you going to get access to, the, to, to a Samoni? Well, you know, using this BitShare system, we can actually create these bit Samoni. Uh, you know, anywhere in the world, any trader can can do that. They can profit from that, um, and uh, and and we can also do that without the need for a bank account. So if if a, a money transfer shop in Tajikistan has cash, which he needs to get into Bitspark, you know, usually how it works is the money transfer shop does a bank wire, right? But we don't have a bank account, so we actually incentivize the market of people to go to our shops and essentially sell a balance to them in exchange for the cash. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a shop has $100 in cash. And let's say someone using our app, they have 100 a bit USD in our app. So that person in the app, they can go, oh, okay, uh, this shop, they, they, they have the cash. I can, I can go and exchange my bit USD for them. But in order for the shop to give me 100 in cash, I'll only give them maybe uh, 99 in BitUSD. So I make a profit. The shop gives me 100 in cash and I give them 99 in digital balance. But you know what? The shop is happy for that because the shop has now been able to fund his BitSpark account digitally. Now his money is in the cloud. It's ready to be able to send, send anywhere in the world. And the person who's gone to the shop has, has made a sweet profit as well. 
So that means that the shop has been able to fund his account in BitSpark without BitSpark needing a bank. And also it's incentivized a market of individuals to essentially visit our shops and do what we call liquidation at the shops. So that is liquidate balances at the shops. And it means that this model can be applied in every country, in every currency, no matter where you are in the world. And we're looking to do a similar thing with one of our MTOs in Africa. Um, uh, you know, and, and that just creates a, an open market for people to be able to do this. Yeah, so let's talk about uh, Zypher. I believe this is your ICO that's, I don't know if it's active now, but what, what is Zypher? What, how did you get the idea to do an ICO, purpose of the coin, and how you'll deploy the funds that you raise, the capital that you raise in your roadmap? Yeah, so talking a little bit about incentives, you know, that's, that's uh, what Zephyr is all about. So um, in probably about two weeks ago now, we, we launched Zephyr to the public. There's about two weeks left on, on the token sale. We end on the 6th of November. Uh, so it's currently live, currently active. You can have a look at uh, zephyr.bitspark.io and see all the information there. But essentially, this is, this is a reward token. And the point of this is to be able to uh, reward MTOs, money transfer businesses, for doing things which they already do, and also for growing the BitSpark network, and for individuals to transact on the BitSpark network as opposed to others. So essentially, when you, as a money transfer shop, sign up, you will get some Zephyr, right? So that's a pretty good value proposition if I can say to you, well, hey, a uh, uh, shop you know, down the road in, in the street, uh, you could go with Western Union and pay them a bunch of money, or you can sign up with us for free, and I will literally give you 300 bucks in Zephyr right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to go and pay someone some money or are you going to go and get paid? Right. So that's an incentive for them to join the network. Great. Now they're joined on the network and now we want them to transact. And of course, every transaction of which they do will also be rewarding them with Zephyr. And in most cases, money transfer shops, maybe they only make, you know, a couple of dollars per transaction. Whereas if we can add on top of that uh, a, a Zephyr award to them, then that's a, that's a compelling value proposition. In, in some cases, it could even double their profits monthly. So, you know, that's, that's a way for us to incentivize the growth of the BitSpark remittance network. And that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to grow this network. We're trying to, you know, get rid of the need for banks because that is just the major holdup around the world, is trying to deal with all of these different banks in all of these different jurisdictions and all of these currencies. It's difficult, there's gatekeepers, you know, it sucks, it's expensive. Um, if we can get everyone onto this BitShares network uh, and onto, you know, sending money between each other in this way, cash in, cash out, well, that's the best option of both ways. So this is the way that we incentivize it. But of course, you know, if we're just dishing out Zephyr, then where's the value for the coin to actually hold, hold a market price? Well, you know, what we do is we actually put a percentage of the fees which we pay every transaction goes back into buying back coins from the market. So for example, if I issue you, you more coins, I only issue them when you do something useful, like send a transaction. And if you send a transaction, you pay a fee, and a percentage of that fee goes towards buying back more coins on the DEX. Mm. And of course, if there's more people buying back, then that means that uh, you know there's more price pressure as well on that coin. So you know that's an incentive that we try and create a positive feedback loop uh, with with the with the Zephyr uh, currency there. So that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve an incentive, a reward, join the network and to be able to do stuff which you already do, but get paid for it. And is the Zephyr token going to be live on the DEX once the ICO is closed? Yep, absolutely. So 6th of November, we, we, we're gonna be trading live on the DEX. And, and since it's a, a, a BitShares token, will it be traded on any other uh, exchanges or is it just going to be on the DEX? I, I don't know, I asked just out of my own curiosity. I, I don't know if smart coins on, uh, BitShares smart coins can be traded on other exchanges. Uh, they can. Uh, so there's a couple of centralized exchanges which currently list uh, BitShares and some of the smart coins and, and stuff like that. We're in discussions with some of the centralized exchanges at the moment. Nothing to announce right now, uh, but our focus really is on, on the DEX at the moment. So you know, that's where it's going to be traded on day one. And of course, I actually like the DEX a lot more than the centralized exchanges mm -hmm. because there's no counterparty, right? You know, no exchange can run away with your money. Um, yeah, it's Your money is your money. You know, when do you see, just a little side co topic here uh, about BitShares specifically, do you see BitShares be becoming popular because of business needs like yours, or do you see it becoming popular because of privacy uh, needs of the individual 
pulling away from the, the centralized exchanges, what, what do you see is the pain that the, the BitShares deck solves more? Well, I think it's a good question. I mean, right now we're seeing Bittrex recently delisted some, some coins. They're coming under a bit of pressure. Uh, Ploniex has been having some issues a few months back. I think they still are with, uh, with cryptocurrencies and withdrawals and people waiting a month in order to get their money. Uh, we've, of course, seen things like an empty Gox and a couple of these other exchanges, you know, going under and running away with the money. So, you know, th there is a problem to be solved in, in exchanges in general. And, uh, and, and as an exchange operator, you know, you are holding millions of dollars in balances, but you don't get any benefit from that. There's no interest that you accrue or, or anything like that. So you have this massive liability sitting there and, you know, that's, that's up to you to, to defend it. And there's, there's hackers all of the time, cyber attacks. And, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, exchanges are just not up to the task. So I think certainly the DEX is solving some problems for people out there that really want to be able to exchange things in a trustless environment. They, they don't want to have to trust their money to some exchange and, and wait 30 days on a support ticket in order to withdraw uh, their tokens. They just want to be able to trade it. And I think you know, that's, that's the great thing that you know, everyone who has a wallet is connected to the exchange. So everyone can just trade with each other. And that's, that's really super cool. So I think that um, you know, BitShares is obviously, in my opinion, it's the most developed DEX. It's got proper charting, it's got you know, proper stuff uh, that's been around for a long time. But I think in general, we're going to see more and more decentralized exchanges over the next couple of years because it, it, yeah, it's, it, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? You know, it's been proven that it can be done. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think there's going to be a lot more people coming up with, with new you know, DEX ideas. Yeah, I really love the idea of re replacing the banks. I mean, I know I rail so hard on the banks in this podcast because, you know, George, we, we met uh, during, you know, the offshore banking thing. Um, but it's just great that we can get price action of or price exposure to these global currencies that th that is the gatekeeper at your Pacific Bank. If we wanted to get exposure to another currency or offer a currency to our clients, who knows how we would do that? I mean, we lost the U.S. dollar for a year, lost the U.S. of the biggest, baddest currency in the world, the settlement currency of the world, your Pacific Bank. We lost it for a year. We couldn't even settle in it. Wow. We, could, we couldn't even <laughs> offer it. Right. And we were jumping through hoops. We were using money transmitters and all this stuff where if we had uh, an account or a wallet on the BitShares DEX, we could have at least gotten the price exposure. You know, I'm still concerned about the on and off ramps with BitShares. You know, we've got a lot of experience with that with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a huge market. It's got the saturation in terms of cryptocurrencies. But it, it, I do see this growing. You know, it's just solving two really big pains. And this comes back to the entrepreneurial aspect. You know, it solves the pain of having price exposure to these currencies for whatever reason you want, right? You don't have to go beg someone or ask someone to open up a bank account for you to get price exposure to these currencies. Um, and it solves the pain of trusting a centralized exchange to manage your wallets. And what if that gets hacked instead of building a decentralized exchange on smart contracts that are audited and provable. And, you know, this is just two enormous pains that a decentralized exchange, specifically BitShares, since it's been around since 2013. And, you know, it, it sometimes it seems almost too good to be true. How do I just invent a bit USD or a bit? Thai bot, but I, I highly recommend that if you don't have an account, go over there and just take a look at what's available. I predict that ICOs and people launching new tokens are going to start using uh, decentralized exchanges, specifically BitShares. I can remember when I interviewed Ned Scott of Steemit, who was working at the time with Dan Larimer on Steam and really pressing him about some of the economics of the Steam dollar, for instance, because I didn't understand it. This was you know, 15 months ago or so, I didn't understand the economics behind how can you tie something to the U.S. dollar when you don't have any U.S. dollars as collateral. But like you said, George, the proof's in the pudding here. Um, it's been running for four years now, the BitShares has, and nothing's, nothing's crashed yet. So I, I'm a huge supporter of BitShares. I'm really excited about EOS specifically, you know, Dan, Dan Larimer is a super smart guy. That's not taking anything away from Ned Scott. I think both these guys are super intelligent. Uh, it's just an exciting time to be alive, George. 
when do you have any restrictions on the ICO and what should people expect in the future from BitSpark? Yes, yeah, so uh, the ICO is, is open to anyone. We, we do have some restrictions about uh, residency. So unfortunately, we can't accept uh, US customers and, and Hong Kong residents at this time uh, for the ICO. But um, apart from that, you know, there's no uh, restrictions on, on the purchase or sale of, of Zephyr tokens. So that will end on, on the 6th of November. And, and really the grand plan is, you know, what are we doing with, with this, this ICO raise? Well, it's, it's exactly what you said. It's about removing the banks. Um, it is about being able, and this is a big problem for money transfer shops all over the world, is all of these money, trans I go to these conferences all the time, and the big, com the, the big problem that they're all saying is, I'm losing my bank account. I'm getting de-risked. Uh, de um, you know, I've been a money transfer shop for 20 years, they'll say, and I've done nothing wrong, and yet the bank is still delisting me, and I lose my, what can I do? And in some cases, they, they, they just end business. That's it. Close up shop. Um, close up shop. And that, that's, that's sad. You know, that is the business has not done anything on their fault of their own. So we're trying to be able to provide an alternative to these money transfer shops and that they can exist. They can still maintain you know, their license. They can do all of their KYC, AML, everything that they need to do, but they just don't need the bank account in order to be able to, to trade and be able to get access to those different currencies. And I think that's a super big deal for these guys. And you know, that, that's what we're trying to do. So you know, over the next few months, we're going to be rolling it out to, we have seven countries at the moment that we operate in. So, you know, Zephyr is going to be rolled out to all of our existing MTOs there. We've also got the UN project um, and we're going to be creating these pegged uh, decentralized cryptocurrencies on the DEX. And essentially the, the, the grand goal with Zephyr is 180 pegged cryptocurrencies mm. tradable in a decentralized market for anyone anywhere in the world. And it doesn't have to be for money transfers. Whatever you want to do with it, you can, you, you can just do it. And, and that's, that'd be fantastic to, to remove all of the need for the gatekeepers. So we have a roadmap with a, with a bunch of different sort of uh, goals that we're trying to hit over the next couple of quarters. Uh, but that's generally the, the idea is, is we, we're rolling it out to all of our existing shops and, and onboarding people as well to, to create that incentive and, and incentive to grow the ecosystem. So as soon as we have the user base and the liquidity, goodbye bank, sayonara, thanks for nothing. Uh, George, Absolutely. If, <laughs> if my audience would like to stay in touch with you or stay up to date with BitSpark and your Zephyr ICO, how should they do it? Yep, you can, uh, you can contact me. Uh, I'm usually on Twitter these days quite a lot, uh, George underscore Harrop. You can contact me there. You can contact BitSpark at info at bitspark.io. Uh, Zephyr, the, all the details are at zephyr.bitspark.io, but certainly check out our website uh, if you've got any questions and uh, yeah, you know, happy to, um, to, to, to answer. Well, George, anybody that's trying to end the international banking cartel is absolutely a Liberty entrepreneur. I really appreciate you coming on to the show. You know, good luck. I'm looking into you guys to potentially pay uh, my remittances to my virtual assistant staff in the Philippines. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you so much, George. And until next time, everyone, you know what to do. Keep building freedom. Thanks, George. Thanks, Ash. See you guys.